me share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah. All right, bet. Thank you. So, and, well, let me kind of get to that. So, when you talk about this idea of the African diaspora, all that means is individuals who have. Um, one second. Let me let her in the waiting room real quick. Okay, so before we get into this, I just want you guys to understand what the diaspora is, right? So di the diaspora is anyone who is um, displaced, and we're talking about in this context, the African diaspora. So if you are, have African descent and you are in the Americas, you're part of the African diaspora. If you have African descent and you're in the Caribbean, you're a part of the African diaspora. If you have African descent and you're in Europe, you're part of the African dis diaspora, right? Um, the same could be true with an Asian experience. So if you have Asian descent and you're in the Americas, you're part of the Asian diaspora. So that's what I mean um, by this notion of the diaspora. Um, one thing that you will find very critical in this course are what were called theoretical frameworks. Um, so please write this down. The first theoretical framework for this course is African-American male theory. Um, I'm going to expand this and just call it African theory, African, African male theory, just because um, it's not strictly pertaining to men. Um, I kind of like to give it a little bit more broader context and include African women as well. Um, this is a theory that is cultivated from the chair of our department, um, Dr. Nana Lawson Bush, and from a couple of his articles and a couple of his books that were published, right? So the theory in the framework, the theory, excuse me, is African-American male theory, AAMT. The framework, it says that African-American boys, men, and women are resilient and resistant. African-American men and women, um, the theory posits that African-American boys, men, and women are both are born with an innate desire for self-determination and with a limited capacity for morality and intelligence. So really what's important, this theory believes that African people are born with an innate desire for self-determination and with an unlimited capacity for morality, so the ability to be moral, and then this idea of intelligence, right? That's innate. So coming out the womb, they have a desire for self-determination and they have an unlimited capacity to be moral and to be intelligent. So for those, um, and as you'll know, if you go through the semester, I'm really not a, a Bible believer per se, um, but I, I do feel that there's some information in there that could be pertinent, right? And so for those of you who are Bible believers, there's a passage in Genesis that says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, right? So this is just the image of um, the creator, of what we may call in the African spiritual context, Abu Tala, um, shaping the first man and the first woman on the planet. And uh, you can notice by their hue or by their melanin con content, they are African, right? So the first human ancestor, the first bones, first remains of human beings was found in Africa. Um, these are, this is an image of those actual bones and those actual remains. Um, they titled this individual Abiyomi. So to kind of give you an opportunity to kind of look at these remains here. So this kind of gives us a timeline of African evolution, right? Um, so you could trace back Lucy, who was found in Ethiopia about 3.2 million years. 
Um, they have found older bones um, that actually now, I need to update this lecture, it should be 8 million years old. Um, the, the image that you've seen before this slide of Abiyomi has been traced back as far as 8 million years old. So one can say that African people and the African experience could be traced back 8 million years old. The modern human um, that goes back 200,000 years old out of East Africa, um, updated information says Cameroon, and actually has been traced back to 340,000 years, years ago. Um, Africans leave Africa in large numbers, so their ability to migrate outside of Africa can be traced back to 60,000 years ago. And then the first modern European, so who we understand to be people from European descent, people who make up the European diaspora, they first arrived on the planet about 30,000 years ago, right? So again, African people can be traced back 8 million years old, 8 million years. Um, the first presence of the European could be traced back about 30,000 years. And this kind of gives you a visual representative representation of the same information. So if you look at the lighter um, brown large circle, that's that um, seven to eight million year period that Africans were placed on the planet, right? Um, the darker green circle, that's that a modern human that could be traced back 300 years ago, 300,000 years ago, what we know as the Homo sapien. Um, the yellow dot is the large scale movement out of Africa that could be traced back 60,000 years ago. And then the little brown dot there, that's the European presence on the planet dating back 30,000 years, okay? So just to kind of give you a visual representation of the genealogy and the um, really the prehistoric nature of African people. So we talk about some individuals prior to European contact. Um, we've already been made aware of Mansa Musa. Um, here's another one of those individuals. Kind of give you opportunity to look at that. He may look like some people you know in the hood, right? Some, some familiar family members and things of that nature. This is Narmer. So Narmer was the ancient Kemetic Pharaoh. And again, when we say Kemet, we just mean Egypt, right? Um, from of the early dynastic period, some consider him the unifier of Egypt um, and founder of the first dynasty, therefore the first pharaoh of unified Kemet. And the reason why the unification becomes important, um, Kemet was split into upper and lower Kemet, and Normer was able to bring them together to one um, country or one uh, nation state. Here's another individual of significance prior to European contact. That brother was Imhotep. Imhotep is the world's first multi-genius. He was the first architect, first physician, and first engineer. He built the first pyramids, the step pyramids, and is the architect of the step pyramid. He also is recognized as a priest, a sage, a poet, a scribe, and an astrologer. As a physician, Imhotep diagnosed and treated over 200 diseases, 15 of the abdomen, 11 of the bladder, 10 of the rectum, 29 of the eyes and 18 of the skin, nails and tongue. He also performed surgeries and practiced some dentistry. All of this occurred 2,200 years before the Western father of medicine, Hippocrates was born. About hundred years after his death, he was elevated to a medical demigod and later into a full God some 2,000 years after his death. He was also worshiped by the Christians, by the early Christians as either the first Christ or as one with Christ. Now I want to kind of go back up to the bullet point number two. Um, he performed surgeries and dentistry. All of this occurred 2,200 years before the Western father of medicine, Hippocrates. So I don't know how many of you are in the medical field or are studying medicine or looking to be going to the medical field. Um, there's what doctors call the Hippocratic Oath. And if you are to become a doctor, you have to take this oath to state how you will go about servicing your patients, right? The Hippocratic Oath derives from Hippocrates, right? And he's recognized in the West as the father of medicine. But we know that that's bullshit because there's no way that he could be the father of medicine when Imhotep did all these things 2,200 years, even before Imhotep, sorry, before Hippocrates was born, right? So not before, Hippocrates was able to do these things, but before Hippocrates actually walked the planet, right? So when you talk about the true father of medicine, it's Imhotep. 
another individual prior to European contact. Um, this is a picture of his mother. Um, that's Agnaten and what they call King, Queen Chi or King, Queen Chigra. So Agnaten was the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Kemet. He ruled for 17 years and died perhaps roughly 1336 BCE or 1334 BCE. He's especially noted for abandoning Christian, sorry, Egyptian polytheism or Kemetic polytheism and introducing the worship uh, centered on Aten. So when you talk about polytheism, right, that's the worshiping or the praising of multiple gods, right? Agnaten was responsible for shifting Kemet from a polytheistic society to a monotheistic society. Monotheistic meaning just the worship of one God. So if you think about Christianity, that's a monotheistic religion. You think about Islam, that's a monotheistic religion. Buddhism is a monotheistic religion. Most of the world's religions today are monotheistic. And we could uh, trace that back to Agnaten transferring the Kemetic dynasty from a poly polytheistic society to a monotheistic society. Um, Agnaten lived at the peak of Kemet's imperial glory. Kemet had never been richer and more powerful or more secure than under his reign. Another individual prior to European contact, uh, this brother here, Taharka. So it's clear from historical account, Taharka was one of the greatest ancient Kemetic pharaohs. Taharka was described by the ancient Greeks as a historian Starbo as having advanced as far as Europe. So he was able to move his army up to Europe and in even as far as the pillars of Hercules in Spain. This feat alone could, would count him among the greatest military tactician, tacticians excuse me, of the ancient world. Um, later, Spanish legendary chronicles also identified Tarco as a general of an Ethiopian army that supposedly campaigned in Spain in the seventh century BCE before his becoming Pharaoh. So Tarco was just a Spanish name for Taharka. This is the same individual. Um, this event has also been held to account for the name of a Spanish city, Tarco, now called Targonia. So there's a name, uh, there's a city in Spain that's actually named after Taharka. Um, in biblical depictions, he is the savior of the Hebrew people as, the, um, as they are being besieged by Cerner. I don't know how to pronounce that, but you could find um, Taharka in the passages Isaiah 37, eight through nine and 2 Kings 19, um, eight through nine. So this is um, the brother that we spoke of earlier at the beginning of the, the course, uh, Mansa Musa. So Musa the first, commonly referred to as Mansa Musa, was the um, was the tenth Mansa, and Mansa just means king, right? Um, so Mansa Musa is translated as king of kings. Uh, Musa embarked on a large building program, raising mosques and schools and colleges. Uh, most famously, the ancient center of learning, the University of Sancor, was constructed during his reign. So the University of Sancor was one of the first world's universities, right? So when you talk about education, that's something that can also be traced back to Africa. Organized education, higher education, that's something that could be traced back to Africa. Um, at the height of his power, Mali had at least 400 cities. Um, another thing about Mansa Musa, he was so wealthy when he traveled in his caravan, he would carry gold with him. And he would have so much gold that it would spill off the caravan. And when that gold spilled off into specific cities, it would change the economy of that city, right? Because now the, the citizens of the city have access to the gold that Mansa Musa left behind and it drastically elevated the economic um, opportunities for the cities that Mansa Musa passed through. So that's how much wealth that Mansa Musa was able to amass. So these are some images of the Moors um, the Moors, so if you think about Morocco at the northern tip of Africa, there's a very small um, body of water that separates that northern tip of Africa, Morocco, from Spain. Um, the Moors were able to trans, tra travel into Europe um, and bring what they call enlightenment 
and bring Europe out of the dark ages. So if you, for those who study history or are familiar with European history, there was a moment where Europe went through what they call the dark ages. Um, famine was something that ran rapid in Europe. Um, the Moors were able to bring civilization to Europe at, during this time, right? The idea of how to run um, sewage ways under the city so that way when you take a shit, it doesn't stay in your dwelling area. Um, they brought the science of having to use, how to use baths, how to literally bathe, right? That was something that the Moors was able to, um, was able to bring to the forefront. Give me one second, you guys. Let me let this individual in. Uh, Um, so while I took a quick break, is there anybody that has questions, thoughts about what I've covered so far? I know I'm kind of moving quickly, but I want to get through this before our time is up. But I, I do want to pause and kind of give you guys the opportunity to ask questions or, or share your thoughts on what's been covered. Uh, I had a question. Do we have to do a journal on the this lecture? Mm -mm. No, just take notes. Um, this kind of informs the way that you're going to shape excuse me, informs the way that you're going to be looking at the individual that you're dealing with, right? So it's just a contextualization of the African experience. Um, any other questions, comments, or concerns? What are your thoughts about what you're learning? This is, this is information that you guys knew before. Like, what's up? Talk, talk to me. Well, me, I'm just really surprised. I had no idea that, uh, like, I had no idea about all of this history and that so many things can be traced to people um, in Africa. So it's really like mind blowing to see all of like the progress that they accomplished and everything that they've accomplished. So, so Natalia, let me ask you this question. Um, why do you think that this, um, why do you think you don't know about this information? Why do you think it's taken for you to get through college and to get to this particular class to learn this information? Well, I would say that it's something that, well, first, it's not something that we're taught about in school. And then also, well, I don't know, we're not really taught about it anywhere, at least me personally. And it's actually something that I've, I don't know how to exactly say it, but it's something that I pondered before because along also with other topics, like how we don't really learn about other like cultures or other people from other ethnicities, like in school, it, we really just learn about like European hi history and what I well, I say like white history. Mm -hmm. And that's really like all we learn um, in school. Um, so somebody help her out. The question is why though? Why do you think that's, we only learn European history, right? Why do you think that um, indigenous history or African history is foreclosed in our educational system? <laughs> I feel like they want us to forget or like not really learn about it and see how like unjustified a lot of things were. Yeah. Somebody else was. was I, uh, I also feel like the like this culture didn't really have like a, that big of an impact towards like uh, European and towards us as much. Because just like you said, um, with the. I forgot the name of the person, but um, he made so many like medical terms that he did before, even though um, before like this one a specific, I forgot the name, this one specific person who said um, they perform all these surgeries and like, they just don't want to give credit to them. Yeah, definitely. I also want to add to what um, Mark said about I think it's about credibility because most of the history that we do have, it's under a white male. Um, usually it's, we remember the names of male people, even though there's been like a lot of women and indigenous people that have discovered and also invented it. Most of modern medicines did come from indigenous people, like their herbs and their ways of treating. And when people, usually Europeans or of white descent would conquer them, they would take it and call it as their own. And since they had more power and at that time they were uh, more advanced in weaponry. So it was just more, they had more power to overcome and take credit and um, shut down everybody else that had an opinion and they just used it to call it as their own. And we just are used to that because that's what we're taught. Yeah, I think you're spot on Claudia, right? It's power. Power is the reason why we don't know any of this information. Um, it's the term that says to the victors goes the spoils, right? So 
to put that in a hood terminology. If I see you on the street, we got a problem, we get into a fight, right? I knock your ass out. At that point, I have the ability to go through your pockets, whatever's in your pockets is mine, them shoes on your feet, those is mine, that watch on your wrist, that's mine, right? I won that battle, so now all of your possessions become my possessions. That's the exact same way that history works, right? So if I conquer your community, then your knowledge, your wealth, your customs, I either take them over or I destroy them so you have no knowledge of those histories, right? So Claudia is absolutely right. The reason why we do not know these things is because of power, right? Um, so let me get back into the lecture. And then again, feel free to stop me, you guys, if you have any questions. Um, I know in the chat, you're asking me if the slides will be available. Remember, I'm recording the session. So I'm going to put the whole recording up on the Google Classroom site. So you have that that way. All right. So we talked about the Moors. Um, So again, I mean, just the Moors, it's important to understand, right? They were responsible for bringing Europe out of that dark ages, right? Literally showing these individuals how to bath, how to run water through their city so they don't have, they have accurate sewage, right? Um, how to use herbs and spices. Um, the whole science of bringing silk and using silk for clothing, they brought that science to Europe, right? being able to change clothes with the season. So if it's cold, you're gonna wear clothes that are adaptable to, clothes, to the cold weather. If it's hot, you're gonna wear clothes that are adaptable to hot weather. That's the science that the Moors brought to Europe, okay? And, and to, I believe it was Claudia's point, I may be wrong, but I don't wanna forget the women, right? And um, the way that this lecture was initially structured was for a rites of passage program that I do um, in San Bernardino in LA that really centers around men, but it's important that we include women in our conversation, right? So we have some significant women here um, on your upper, what's that left-hand side? If you're looking at your screen, um, that is Hepshepsut, one of the great comedic pharaohs. Below her is Ma'at, and that's a, a, a deity. One second. Let me let Mark in. Um, so Ma'at is a deity that we'll get into. And in fact, as we go through our readings, um, I think on the third week, we'll, we'll read explicitly about Ma'at. Um, the one in the middle is Queen Makeda. Um, she was Ethiopian empress uh, who had a very large legacy in Ethiopia. Um, to your right on the upper portion here in the corner. Um, you can't see the whole image, but that is an entrance into the temple. Um, that's an image of, I wanna say Queen T, which was the mother of um, Agnaten. And if you've seen the other entrance to the temple, that would be an image of her husband, right? But what's important is they're made parallel to one another. Her, the queen size, and dimensions are just as large as the king size and dimensions. And they do that purposefully to show the equality between men and women, right? There is no difference between a woman being able to rule and a man, and a man being able to rule. Um, on the bottom is Ya Santiwa. She was a, um, a, 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 a priestess and a queen from Ghana who um, was very responsible in fighting the invasion of Europeans into to West Africa, into the Gold Coast. So definitely we wanna always shout out and echo the presence and the power of women. So kind of give you some, uh, a look at some of the ancient African kingdoms prior to European invasion. Uh, you'll see up in your upper right-hand corner, right above Kush is Kemet, below Kemet is Kush. And you just see a, a variety of different um, nation states prior to Europe coming through and carving up the African continent. Kind of give you some images of the ancient Kemetic temples, some of the ancient mystery schools. These are where they conducted their universities. Um, the image on your bottom right there of those pillars, 
Um, you may not be able to see that, but there's inscriptions on the pillars that allow you to study the stars, study astrology, study mathematics and geometry, right? So a part of comedic um, pedagogy or comedic teaching was blending beauty, a beautiful aesthetic with a educational purpose, right? So again, you see the, the beauty of these pillars, but they also have an educational component to accompany them. Another um, visual, just kind of depicting the science of um, and, and how keenly aware the ancient comedics were to the astrology. So the three pyramids that you see on your upper right hand corner, they're directly aligned with the stars of Orion's belt, right? And you can see on the image to the left, the larger image, you see how um, the pyramids align with Orion's belt which is in this image that you see of the individual is a SAR, right? Which is one of the ancient comedic deities that is really um, a centerpiece for their spiritual practice and their spiritual traditions. We, you know, I don't think we'll watch this now just for sake of time. Let me see. Let me see, Let me see how long it is. Yeah, we'll skip this for now. So a lot of people question this idea of were the comedics black, were they African? Um, they say that, you know, if you believe in the movies, right, they, they want to depict Queen um, Cleopatra as Elizabeth Taylor, depict her as a white woman. Um, that is historically inaccurate. Um, I'm not denying a European presence in uh, what we'll call Egypt. But the, original, the originators who built the pyramids and who um, cultivated this society, they were African, right? There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, what happens is the Hyksos, the Romans, and the Greeks, they invaded Kemet and were, av were able to take over the, the nation state, right? Um, another thing to understand when it comes about Kemet and when it comes, about to their, when it comes to their universities, right? Um, you, Kemet at this time was the centerpiece for learning, right? All knowledge production came from that Kemetic center. For you to be considered remotely educational or remotely informed, you had to spend a minimum of seven years within the ancient Kemetic mystery schools. So you think about your Western philosophers, um, Plato, Socrates, all these individuals, they were trained under the comedic mystery schools, right? So even this notion of philosophy is an African tradition that the Europeans were able to um, siphon, steal, and, and claim as their own, right? And if you read the ancient texts of individuals like Socrates and Plato, they give credit to the individuals who educated them. They'll talk about how they had to go to Kemet and learn from the, um, the mystery schools down there in Kemet. But just to kind of take a look at the, um, the, the image here, they say uh, the image A is the, how the Kemetic seen himself, right? They're the black phenotype, the black skin color of the skin. Um, B is the Indo-European, right? Those who um, were able to, who invaded the Kemetic nation state. Um, C is how they viewed other Africans outside of Kemet. Right, so the people who made up Kush, the people who made up um, Timbuktu, this is how they depicted those individuals. And, and D is the, semi, the Semites, right? So those are the mixture of the European and the Africans. So again, clearly the originators of this Kemetic nation state were African people, but we're not denying the fact that it was invaded, it was taken over by Europeans. Hence the shift from Kemet to Egypt. Egypt took place once the Europeans took over that area. So another thing that takes place as Kemet is being invaded and being overran, African people are moving west, right? And they're taking with them the knowledge, the wisdom, the spiritual sciences that they've learned while in Kemet and they're traveling and taking that information west. 
Hence, you see the University of Sankor that Mansa Musa was able to cultivate. Um, hence, things like Timbuktu, which was a, a also one of, I want to say the nation, I'm sorry, the world's second university, right? So they continue these traditions and move them west. And what you'll see is a lot of the spiritual practices of the communities like the Akan, which is in Ghana or in West Africa, they mirror a lot of the spiritual traditions of Kimi. And that's because that information was traveled, was taken with the Africans who traveled west to avoid European invasion, right? And again, this is um, Timbuktu. This is where the area that um, Mansa Musa was from, that Mali Empire, um, in between the Shanghai and the Mali Empire is Timbuktu, one of the, uh, the second university in the world, a high center for learning, some images of Timbuktu. Coupled with this trans this travel west, um, this is one of what you call the Dogon Society. Um, they are also in this area of Mali. Um, what makes the Dogon society um, famous and of great significance was their ability to view the series star A with their naked eye, right? So they didn't have a telescope, they didn't have any of the technology that we have nowadays to view the series star A. They did that with the naked eye. And that just, again, shows the connection between Kemet and the scholars and the intellectuals in West Africa and their ability to tap into astrology, their, tap, their ability to tap into spiritual sciences. All right, you know what? Um, we have a little time. So I'll, I'll go back and play that video and then we'll, we'll open it up for conversation. So just again, to kind of give you a, a, a touch base, this is speaking on how the comedic individuals built their nation, built their society in alignment with the um, with nature, right? Um, the astrology was a key component to the cultivation of comedic society. And we'll hear from Asha Kwesi as he provides us more details. We still what? Now you can see. Now you can see all three pyramids. Now on the further back is the pyramid of Khufu, Kafra, and Menkara. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors had astronomical science, astrology, where they studied the stars and so forth. One of the things that's been brought to astronomers' attention is that they noticed that the pyramid of Khufu and Kafra, if you notice right here, or in a perfect alignment, okay? It's a perfect alignment. But the question is, is that why would such a perfect alignment and perfect structure where they built the small pyramid of Mikara off course? Can you see it off course? Yeah. But what they found though, is that our ancestors were building the pyramids in alignment with the stars. That they were in rhythm with the astrology and the astronomical science of the universe, science of astrology or the study of the stars. And what they found is that the star system Orion was the star system of Osiris. Remember, the king wants to become one with Osiris. So by aligning the pyramid of Khufu, Kufra, and Mikara with Orion, and that's why they built the pyramid of Mikara slightly over and not in alignment, because the pyramids were built off the alignment of the star system Orion. The star system Ceres was Isis. So our ancestors, in essence, were building heaven on earth. They were taking the science of the stars and building the pyramids exactly as they saw the heavenly body or the cosmological universe. Figure out why Mikara's pyramid was not in a perfect alignment, but it fits with the alignment of the star system Orion. As well as the other pyramid layout, it fits into the constellation that our ancestors saw of Osiris. And that is the constellation of the man that you have today as a figure of a man so you can take and put the star system Orion right over the pyramid of Khufu, Kufra, and Mikara and see why they had the alignment of Mikara slightly over because it fit with the star system Orion because the purpose was for the soul to ascend into heaven, for the spirit to ascend into heaven, to become one with Osiris. And the star system Orion was connected with Osiris. Keep in mind that the star system Orion was aligned perfectly with the chambers of the pyramids that we're going to deal with uh, later on in our lecture series when we get into it. 
So this is serious knowledge to show you how profound our ancestors saw that they were building and with the constellation of the universe. Tomorrow, when you go into Saqqara, you're also going to see the Pyramid of Unis, showing the first concept of ascension into heaven. Long before there was Christianity, long before there were little white angels with wings on there, that we get a concept that we're going to go to heaven. Unis already had the concept of ascension into heaven, or, or, or a spirit going into heaven known as uh, astral theology. So this is what our ancestors saw, the soul becoming one with the great god Osiris and the constellation of Orion which was the symbol for Osiris. And the star system Ceres was for Isis. Powerful astronomical knowledge that our ancestors had, showing how in tune our ancestors were with the heavenly bodies, in essence, building heaven on Earth. Even in the Hermetic text, it speaks of a star is our father in heaven. And he looked down on his kingdom that he built. Oh, just before. So let me show you something here. This is the kingdom, this is a SAR in Orion's belt now. See a SAR in Orion's belt, looking down on his kingdom? And Amos in the Bible, it speaks of, seek of him who is of the star, the seven stars of Orion. Now, let me, let me lay something on you. Our Father, which art in heaven, thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where it all is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that was a SAR. And come back here to do serious field educational work. So when someone tells you about the pyramids, you can really break it down. Break it down to our Father which art in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right here, this is where it started. That was taken from the hermetic text of your ancestors long before the Ptolemies got the uh, Jews to write the Bible and the first European Bible was written right here in Egypt and it was Ptolemy Philadelphus who got them to write for them which they copied it from the pyramid text of our African ancestors so now can we validate this oh yes we're going to validate this even further when we get inside of the museum in just a little while and okay brothers and sisters as we talked about the pyramids and the capstone this is a capstone of the king a minute uh a the third of the 12th dynastic period these capstones were put on top of the pyramids this capstone right here is from hawawa it's a capstone of a the third as he was called ni maat ra Amenahet III, and that's his name here, Subet Nima'at Ra, given life for eternity. And what you see here are the all-seeing eyes of Asar and Ra Harakte, or the wings representing the rising spirit, the Sahu spirit. Remember Asar, who was the great king, as I said, in Orion's belt, represented Asar. He was what? Our father, which art in heaven, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where would we find the Orion Act? Can we validate this? Can we validate with even a man by the name of Robert Bouvel, who many Egyptologists smashed down when he tried to say that Asar represented Orion's belt and Orion represented Sahu. That was the spiritual star for us to go to. Well, we can find it. You hold this for me. I want to show you something. Have patience here. This is very small. So where is this symbol at of Asar and Orion? Where is this symbol at? Well, let's go right over here and look closely. And what symbol do you see right here? What symbol do you see right there? You see Orion, you see Asar right there. That validate that this capstone validates it on this capstone right here, Nima'at Ra. This was of the 12th dynastic period. Over 4,000 years ago, this came from right here. All right.
So that will conclude the lecture. Let's um, we'll spend the most of the, the remainder of our time just kind of dialoguing the information you guys came across. Um, so I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, com comments, concerns. I know I, we talked about it a little bit, but let's go a bit, little bit more into detail. Um, anybody wants to call Cap, right? Say I'm lying. I'm making up this shit. That's that's fair too. I'm curious to hear your your thoughts though. So the floor is open. No, I just think it's pretty cool how, like, uh, even before, like, all this technology, like, in Egyptians, how they built the pyramids with aligning with stars. Like, even though, like, they can't, they couldn't measure it accurately, like, with the stars, like, how far or how the distance they were, they still were able to do it, to do with them with the pyramids. I just think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the level of intelligence cannot be surpassed, right? So if, if you think about, how many people try to emulate the pyramids still can't do it at the magnificent level that it was done, right? Um, with all the modern technology that we have to this day, they still cannot build a structure as solid and is able to stand the test of time like the pyramids, right? And you come, they come up with all these theories to undermine the individuals who created the pyramids. Um, aliens came in and built the pyramid. They come up with all kinds of shit, right? Except giving credit to where credit's due, right? Um, how does this information alter the way you look at what we now call Black people? I feel like when we think about Black people, our mind automatically connects it to slavery because that's, that's what we're taught in school, you know? But I feel like like this, just this lecture in general kind of changes my perspective a little bit, you know, because like now I'm like, you know what, you know, I know a little bit more about it other than, you know, that slavery existed. Absolutely. Um, and, and, I, and I think what's important to understand, right, and this is why I'm very critical on terminology, and that's why I will not use the term slaves and I will not allow you to use the term slaves in this course because there was no, excuse me, there was no slaves that were kidnapped out of Africa and brought to the Americas. There were architects, there were scientists, there were fathers, there were mothers, right? There were physicians and thinkers. The people who built the pyramids are the same individuals who were snatched up and brought to this country, right? So it's vitally important that we begin to change the way that we understand this notion of blackness, right? Because it's easy to make yourself comfortable with seeing someone whose legacy is a slave be murdered on camera. That's easy, right? You could justify that, you could rationalize that because a slave's life, it has no value. The only life, the only value that a slave life has is its ability to work, right? It's the only value that, uh, uh, of someone enslaved, right? But when you think about an individual who was somebody's father, an individual who cured diseases of the eye, the heart, the liver, right? And then you think about that individual being on a camera being murdered for no reason, that's gonna situate and make you feel a little bit different, right? So it's important that we get beyond this notion of the black experience starting with enslavement, right? In fact, the slave experience is a drop in the bucket compared to the overall African experience, right? In fact, the, the Western civilization is a drop in the bucket compared to the overall African experience. Think back to the lecture in those circles, right? You had the big circle, which is the six, eight million years that Africans have walked this planet, juxtaposed to that little dot, which is the um, 30,000 years that the European came onto the planet, right? Um, other thoughts, other questions, other concerns? I have a question about, this, about yeah. the, the school that you said before, like how you put a picture up of the, these like towers and like how, like that's how people could learn like in all the writing of the towers. Was that like how school was or how, how was the school or the university back like, yeah. then? That's a great question. How did they learn? All this? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, I'm gonna provide sources so you don't think I can look it up. Um, there's a book called by George G.M. James. It's called The Stolen Legacy, um, The African Origins of Western Philosophy, right? And in that book, he articulates exactly what you're asking, Mark, 
what the Comedic Mystery Schools look like. So just as we have your um, freshmen, your sophomore, your juniors, your seniors, um, they had the same format, except it wasn't to where, okay, you did this work, then you could become a sophomore, right? Um, it wasn't about how much time you spent in the school. It was about spiritual mastery, right? So you may come in with as the level as what we understand as freshmen, and your task will be to master your physical self, right? Can you sit in tw two hours of meditation straight, right? Can you master your body? And once you be able, once you're able to master your body, then you could go to what we understand as a sophomore, right? So it was not about essentially um, strictly intellectual ability, but it was about spiritual principles and spiritual ideas and spiritual concepts, right? The spiritual and the intellectual was merged, right? So in the um, when you get to the level of sophomore, there may be another type of task that you must learn. You must become familiar with astrology, right? You must be familiar with how to use music to heal organs, right? This is something that was done in Kimmin as well. They found a specific frequency of music that was able to heal the body, right? So once you are able to tap into that, you could ascend beyond sophomore and go to the level of junior, right? And then when you get to junior, you have another type of um, spiritual challenge that you must overcome. So the foundation of schooling, you see borrowed and, and applied to Western um, education uh, systems, but what's left out is the spiritual element, right? Um, when you, when we kind of, are we going to read that? No, you guys won't read that, that's that reading. But you'll get a bigger, a, a better concept of that when we start our readings next week. You kind of get to see what was important for these individuals in that society. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Any other questions, any other comments, any concerns? Somebody I have not heard from today. I have a question. So, um... You're saying that the Indo-Europeans invaded ancient Egypt. I was wondering if they're still like racially white. Yeah, so at, let me make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, that when the Europeans invaded Kemet, were their racial, their phenotype, was it white? Is what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at um, the images, right, they depict them as white. Like they, they, they paint them as white people. Right? Let me, I'll, I'll go back in one second. Right, so like these, these are white people, you know? Um, so even they were aware of, of, of their phenotype at the time. Does that ask you a question, Gabriella? Yeah, I just wasn't sure because I've heard different things as far as ancient Egypt, if there were actually white people at that time. Well, like, what did you hear? Well, just there's always that debate if like um, ancient Egyptians were white or not, because for some reason they try to depict them as white people. So I was just wondering if back then there were so, black people. The ancient Kemetic individuals were not white. They were African. They were dark as me and probably darker, right? Um, what happens is Europeans from Greece and Rome try to um, invade Kemet, as well as, um, I'm trying to think, they called them the Hyksos but they would be from like the Mediterranean Sea, right? So, or, or what we may know as Arabs now, right? Those were the two forces that sought to invade Kemet. And, you know, with those two parts of invasion, you had not only them bringing in their cultures, right? And their phenotypes, but they would mix with the Kemetics, right? They, they had babies. So that also helped to lighten up the, um, the phenotypical look of the Kemetic people. And over time, um, as the Kemetics fled West, Europe maintained their hold on Kemet, right? And, and I believe um, that's when they started to call it Alexandria, because Alexander the Great came in and conquered e Egypt, right? So over being there for long periods of time, it started to get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, really, it's no different from the history of California, right? Ca California was an indigenous area, right? The people who occupied this land of California look more like um, Jenny Hernandez and um, Mark and probably a little bit darker than y'all to be real with you, right? But Europeans, they come in, they, they invade, they mix and match. And over time it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And now it's to the point to where they could be telling you to go back to your country, 
right? So the history and the genealogy of land and conquering is really not too much different, right? To the, the victor goes the spoil. So very good question. Anything else? Any other thoughts, comments? Anything that made anything that made y'all feel uneasy? Um, I I think something that I found interesting, like it kind of opened my eye. It, uh, yeah. So this lecture kind of opened my eye to like the depictions of Egyptians because yeah, I would normally see that like they're more of a lighter skin, but like I never realized that they're. Like I knew that like there were African Egyptians, but I didn't know that like they're like um dark like they're depicted in like darker shades of skin color. And and I, and I think too like think about this right. I'm trying to be, think the best way to articulate this for you guys to understand. Have you um have you guys heard of albinos? Yeah. Okay. So two black people can come together and produce a, an albino, right? So from, um, from the, by, the byproduct of two black individuals, you get the full color spectrum from albino all the way to the blackest of the black, right? What cannot be done, two white individuals cannot come together to produce a black baby. Can, scientifically, that cannot be done, right? Why do I bring this up? It's just to show you that out of black, you get the full color spectrum, right? That can be produced from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark. That could be a byproduct of blackness. The opposite cannot be done, right? So when you think about what Jack says, you can see the, you see the representation of all these various types of individuals described as comedic or Egyptian. One, we know about the invasion, right? But two, Phenotypically speaking, scientifically speaking, black folks can't produce white babies. That's what, what an albino is, right? So from our DNA, we can produce all of the colors of the color spectrum. So, um, but what Hollywood does, um, if we cannot devalue it, we'll make it our own, right? So there's no way that I can devalue the pyramids. You see them, right? There's no way that I could, um, devalue what we call the Sphinx or what's actually called the Herm Akit, right? But I can say that we made it. Um, does anybody know the, so when I say the Sphinx, do you know the image that I'm talking about? Do you know what that looks like? No? The statue like the cat like there, you know? Yes, okay. Let me, I'll pull, a, pull one up for y'all just so everybody can all be on the same, same page. Give me one second. So this is the Sphinx. This is also, so what the Kamex would call the Herm Akit, right? Um, if, look at the face, look at the nose. What do y'all notice about the nose and the face? It's missing the nose. It's missing the nose, absolutely. Um, so legend has it, have y'all heard of 21 gun salute? The terminology for like, if anybody's in like a military family, the 21 gun salute, somebody, okay. So legend has it, the term 21 gun salute derives from the Sphinx missing his nose. Um, everybody, for anybody familiar with Napoleon Bonaparte from France? He was the um, warrior, the Napoleonic complex, right? Short little motherfucker who wanted to take over the world. So when Napoleon arrives to Kemet, and he sees the Sphinx, he sees the features of the Sphinx, the broad nose of the Sphinx, the full lips of the Sphinx. It, 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 it put him in a state of derangement, right? He got so pissed off, he took his cannons and shot the Sphinx 21 times, knocking off the nose. That is done to devalue and decredit the fact that these individuals had African features, right? So now we can say that sure, we built the Sphinx because we don't have the signifiers, the lips and the nose to let you know that that's an African individual, right? So again, back to this notion of if you cannot 
discredit or devalue it, we'll claim it as our own, right? And, and just to give you the, the spiritual science behind the Sphinx. So if you notice, it's a man's head and the back of it is a lion's body, right? Wiley recognized the lion is the most, is the king of the jungle, right? The most fiercest animal on the planet. So what they were trying to depict is, and we heard in the video, this notion of spiritual ascension, right? To get to the highest self. So the Sphinx is depicting man's ability to conquer their animal nature and use reason and to think, right? So this idea of the higher self, right? Um, you have your higher self and your lower self, right? So what they say is your higher self is your spiritual wisdom, is your divine wisdom. It's your um, tapping and your connectedness to the most high, right? But your lower self is your cardinal self. Even if so those who are familiar with chakras, right? Your root chakra, your grounded chakra are tied to things of the, of the flesh, right? Your need to reproduce, right? So with that model, with that statue is, de is depicting is we're teaching individuals within our society to master self, to get to your higher self so you can overcome your animal nature. So if you go back to Mark's question, what was the schools about, right? What were the schools teaching? They were teaching you tactics, practices, and techniques to overcome that animal nature and ascend to your higher self. So everything that was done had a spiritual component to it, right? Nothing was done trivial. Other questions, other comments, other concerns? Give me one more and we'll call it a day. Uh, I guess I got a comment. Yeah. Uh, I just thought how it was interesting how um, the 21 salute, like the, the nose, I, I never heard about that before. So I just found that really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they, they went through great feats to, um, discredit the greatness of African people, right? Um, even now, if you go to the museums in Europe, if you go to museums in France, right? They have these artifacts from when they went and invaded Kemet and pillaged all the information and took them back to these European um, centers of learning, right? So it's all there, but you just have to know to look for it, right? So um, we'll end here. Um, I will send out an email no later than Friday, letting you know who's in group A and then who's in group B. Remember group A will meet on Monday, group B will meet on Wednesday. Um, also within that email, I'll email you the readings that will be due for Monday. Um, we're reading the teachings of Patahotep, the oldest book in the world. So if we are to, um, I'll show you guys one second. So if we are to go to our Google Classroom site, it would be under classwork, under readings for what one through three, it would be Hilliard, Hilliard, these two are one reading. Okay, so read both of these and this will make up your journal um, for Monday's class as well as Wednesday's class. So this PDF and this PDF will be your readings for Monday. Again, I'll send them out to you guys via email, but if you wanted to get a jump on them now, um, you have the ability to do so. I made those readily available to you. Um, again, in your journal, I'm just looking for the problem or the thesis of which you read, right? How does the author present the problem or the thesis? The second bullet point or the second paragraph will be um, how did you, what your analysis is? So how did you make sense of what you read, right? Um, can you relate this to things that you read outside of this course, right? So some of these um, readings reminded me of the Bible, you know, however you go about the process of making this make sense. Um, your, final in, your final bullet point or final sentence or final paragraph will be on how does this reading relate to our moment in 2021, right? So how does the oldest book in the world become applicable to what we're going through right now. So those are the three things that I'm looking for in your journal entry. Again, it could be a bullet point, it could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, it's totally up to you. I'm just looking for you to engage those three components. Does that make sense? 
And then what I'll do is I'll um, I'll take a journal myself, and then we'll um, we'll walk through my journal to give you guys a better idea of what I'm looking for in the journals. All right. Any last minute questions, comments, or concerns? <laughs> 